please rise. I'll call the meeting to order and join me in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I want to thank everyone for coming. We have five persons um, that have asked to speak, and so since it's five or fewer, we'll give up to three minutes each. First up is Wendy Hansen to talk about school start time. Good evening. My name is Wendy Hansen. I'm the parent of a student in the district and the parent of a student who has graduated from the district. And I was also a member of the school start time advisory committee. I was not present at the last meeting, but I did watch it on YouTube, um, and I did watch the report that was presented to you uh, by Tracy and I believe David. I apologize if I have the name incorrect. Uh, they were the folks that were doing the facilitating for us, and they did an excellent job at our meetings of keeping us on track. Um, however, the report that they presented was neither crafted by the committee, nor did we have a chance to see the report before they presented it to you. Um, I've been speaking with other members of the committee and we feel that the, what was in the report is probably not the takeaway that we would like um, you to have from, from all of the work that we did. Again, the facilitators asked us at the very last meeting uh, to rank um, a series of uh, proposals, uh, you know, starting all the kids at one time, starting these kids at this time, they brought those with them and we did rank them. However, that was just one exercise uh, and that was at the very end of all of our work. Um, and it really didn't make up the bulk of our work. And I think what we were really tasked with was um, looking at the data and evaluating it and deciding um, whether this is something that, that we think is important for the board to continue looking into. Um, it's true that the committee did dwindle a little bit after COVID, uh, but we had a lot of really smart uh, folks on the committee, including uh, public health professionals, uh, medical professionals, mental health professionals, um, and educators at uh, all levels of uh, school, um, all the way up to university professors. Um, and what we found was the data regarding school start times was overwhelmingly in support of a start time of 8.30 a.m. or later for middle and high school students. Um, at the very last meeting, um, it, was, it was my feeling and the feeling of my uh, colleagues that I've been speaking with that it was pretty much unanimous uh, that everyone there felt that this is something that, that we should look into that really should be implemented in the Hudson schools. Um, and again, we, we aren't experts in busing or after school activities, but I don't think that's really what we were asked to look at. So uh, I, um, I feel that all the work we did, we really haven't had a chance to talk with the board and present our findings. And I would ask that we able, be able to do that during the July working session. I also believe that we should take advantage of the fact that um, the very top researchers in the nation on school start time are only 30 miles away at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I think that we, uh, in order to educate ourselves and members of the community, it would be a really great idea if we were to invite someone uh, from the University of Minnesota to come and talk to us all about school start time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Why won't this show? All right. Uh, next up is Monica Alexander, and her, she is from 142 Bridgewater Trail. I forgot to ask our first speaker to announce her address, but she had listed it as 809 Third Street, Hudson. So um, Ms. Alexander could come forward. I guess her topics are 1619 Project, the Critical Race Theory, and Masks. Okay, uh, my name is Monica. Alexander and uh, I live in this community. I have a child that attends Hudson High School and I would like to address this board tonight. I would like to be heard 
And I would like the board to take under consideration the things that I have to say and that you would in the future, in the very near future, that you would have an honest and open discussion among yourselves about the concerns that I have. I do not want critical race theory taught in a Hudson School District. Neither do I want anything pertaining to the 1619 Project taught in the Hudson School District. I am against government-sanctioned racism and indoctrination of our children. I do not want one uh, race told that they are the oppressor and one race is a victim in perpetuity. The children should be taught how to think, not what to think. Let's get back to teaching the children the history of this country and the greatness of our nation along with the good, the bad, and the ugly without singling out one race to make them feel bad just for being born. I, you're going to have to allow me time to say this. I'm going to say it anyway. Another thing is, I want to know where you, as the board, this school board, where do you stand with mandatory vaccinations of the children? My student already has health issues, and I am not about to add to those health issues with something that is experimental and has not yet been cleared by the FDA risking his life. There should be a choice. And for those students who, for whatever reason, are not vaccinated, will you require that a mask be worn? Enough of the mask already. To require the mask is burdensome and unsanitary. I don't want the kids who are not vaccinated singled out with having to wear a mask. To me, to me now, it would be just like a slave having to wear a collar and a chain around his neck. If you are going to continue to require the mask mandate, the kids have been devastated enough already. No more mask, no critical race theory, no 1619 project in this school district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is David Austigian at 849 Waldruff Farm Road. And I'm sorry if I Thanks very much. butchered your name. It's Austigian, but that's Ostigian. good enough. Austigian, all right. So I've had three children graduate from this high school. Uh, you guys do a phenomenal job of educating the kids. And I want to I just provide my appreciation for my daughter who just graduated and my son who's coming in as a freshman this year. So I have a couple questions with regards to this equity study. My first question is, my understanding is we spent $40,000 to get this study done. Um, my question is, what criteria was used to select the vendor to provide ICS to provide this recommendation or this audit? Do you guys have that criteria? Did you guys provide, did you guys have specified criteria that you use to select the vendor? Yeah, this is your time to make comment. Okay. It's not a time for a okay. back and All forth right. discourse. So you guys have that. That's great. I'll look that. I'll, I'll find that. Um, how many vendors were audited or selected that went through that criteria? And then um, my question is, has ICS ever provided a recommendation contrary to moving forward with the agenda? Those are the questions I have. And I hope you guys can provide that in the audit. Um, I can't emphasize any more than what this um, woman provided ahead of me. My grandfather, my grandparents, my great grandparents were genocide. Uh, my grandfather was a slave for the same exact um, 
the same exact agenda, theories, and things that you're providing in this kind of study. They were killed, murdered, because of who they were, what they believed, and their, their ethnicity. It's, it's ridiculous. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you very much. Next up is Jackie Nickham of 2663 Hilltop Lane. It says River Falls. Mama, are you a Hudson School District resident? No, I'm sorry. This is the time for residents of the district to provide comment. And we've had recent experience of folks from outside the district attempting to comment on district policy and so forth. So if you have somebody from within the district that can make your um, comments known. Also, you're welcome to always send an email as well. All right, well, thank you. All right, next up is Carol Arantz, or Irantz. Um, she's for, at 613 Knollwood Drive, and her subject is about equity. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. This school district has a great reputation already, and I don't understand why we need to do these studies and bring in things that are causing division around the nation. Semantics have been weaponized by the left to introduce all kinds of bad ideas in the past few decades, and the majority of Americans haven't noticed, so that's on us, but no more. We the people and we the parents are now standing for truth, and truth is anathema to the left. So we are going to stand for truth because that's what our children need to learn. We're gonna stand for the US Constitution and that means that we are not listening to the lies or blindly following unconstitutional laws, mandates and all that stuff anymore. If it's unconstitutional, we do not have to follow it. That is in the Constitution. Equity is an example of a great sounding word but it's very different from equality. Equity demands that everyone's needs basically are the same. Everyone needs the same thing and that's just not true. Blind people, need seeing eye dogs. I don't need one. And that's ba the, the basic idea of equity. It makes no sense. It's not being seen as equal under the law, which is what equality is. And it's not having equal opportunities under the law either. It's a socialist slash Marxist buzzword. And the end result is communism, just like the very device of CRT and all the other really great sounding but very dangerous rhetoric that's been flooding our media, our streets, and our schools. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet and lies by any other name are just as dangerous. Let's get back to what MLK Jr. said and judge people by the content of their character, not their skin color, not anything else, not by some equity thing that is what or whatever someone says it is. Let's not try to push these so-called dangerous diversity, equity, and inclusion ideas, which only sound good. Let's follow our constitution, which isn't perfect, neither is our history, but let's be honest about our history. And it has worked so well for over 200 years that thousands, probably millions of people around the world have come here and want to come here for the liberty that we still have and that we are going to do our very best to hang on to and can continue to stand for. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comment portion of the meeting. Next up is our equity audit presentation by ICS. Could our guests please come forward and make their presentation? Hi there, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. Okay, so you should be able to see the slides. Is that true? Yes. yes. Hold, hold on one second. I'm not sure they can. There we go. All right, thank you. So first of all, I'm Elise Vitura. I'm one of the co-founders of ICS Equity. And we want to, um, to begin with and thank you for this opportunity, one, to do the evaluation and two, to have this opportunity to share the results with you. Um, a little bit about my background. I had been 
a high school teacher, a middle school teacher, uh, a district office administrator, director of student services and special ed for 15 years. And then I went into higher ed. I'm currently professor emeritus from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee campus, where I was a professor in the Department of Administrative Leadership, where we train superintendents, building principals, directors of student services and teaching and learning. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to the other co-founder of ICS, Colleen Capper, where she can introduce herself as well. Good evening, everyone. I'm Colleen Capper. I'm Professor Emeritus from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Like Elise, I uh, have been a teacher, also an administrator um, in my, I've uh, been in Wisconsin like uh, over 30 years. Um, and so uh, my work at the university was focused on preparing superintendents and preparing school leaders um, for high quality teaching and learning in schools. So we're excited to have this time with you and thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and- Colleen Capper, I'm Professor Emeritus from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Like Elise, I um, have been a teacher, also an administrator. So there's an echo, can I continue to go? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we just okay. Ahead. Sure, so you should be good to go. Okay, very good. Uh, so just a little bit about um, ICS equity. Um, we've actually, I'm gonna actually just skip to the, the next slide. So we've actually um, been doing this work for over 30 years, um, both as Colleen said, as professors, administrators and working with school districts. Um, we are part of a larger team. So Colleen and I are the co-founders, but we work with uh, five or six other facilitators um, Colleen and I both did um, the equity evaluation for Hudson School District. So we wanted to let you know that. A little bit about the report and what we're gonna do tonight. We're going to do a very brief overview. We'll do an introduction. We'll talk a little bit about specific quantitative data, the focus group themes, and then we're gonna spend the majority of our time on essential next steps, basically the recommendations of the report. We wanted to start out with the importance of how positive people were about the district, just hands down. And I think this is true of people that made comments during open session um, just a few minutes ago, that they were uh, nearly all participants expressed very positive belief of the capabilities of teachers and administrators, very complimentary of the work of the district around COVID. They found that uh, there was a tremendous amount of support of the district's communicative responses with, um, in the community and families. Overall, just a really positive um, perception and gratitude for the district. And I think that's really important. We do a range of different evaluations and that doesn't always happen. And so we think it's really important that along with um, critical recommendations that individuals across the district and the community made during focus groups, it was hands down, they repeated the comments that we have just listed here. So a little bit um, about our work and how we actually approach this work. Um, we understand that uh, you know, equity, just as far as the conversation of what it is, to us it's high quality teaching and learning for all students. That's what equity is across race, disability, language, social class, religion, gender, sexual gender, identity, and all their intersections. And so our recommendations, which we also um, really looked at as essential next steps within this report, really advance the learning of all students. It's not about one group of students over another group of students. Um, we look at it as, you know, equity is not a zero sum game it actually advances learning of all. And so all the districts that we've worked with and we continue to work with, when gains are made of kids who have not typically made gains, the learning of all kids increases or improves. And so it's really important that we cast a very broad net of really seeing equity as high quality teaching and learning for all students. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Colleen and she's gonna start with the district's pupil and non-discrimination policy. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, it says you cannot share while the other person is sharing. So if you could stop sharing yours, great. Here, so can you see my slides? Yes, we can. 
Great, thank you. So we just want to start with, um, in the state of Wisconsin, there's a law, Chapter 118.13, uh, which is called the Wisconsin Pupil Non-Discrimination Law. And all districts in the state of Wisconsin have to adhere by that law. And um, so uh, as all districts in Wisconsin have adopted that because they're required to do so as a public school district, um, that all districts in Wisconsin have a pupil non-discrimination policy. And so I'm just gonna actually read the policy because not everyone attending may be familiar with it because I think um, it's important to know uh, uh, the work that the district is guided by, um, by, the, by these uh, state laws. And so I'm just gonna read it. The district is committed and dedicated to the task of providing the best education possible for every student in the district. With this goal in mind and consistent with legal requirements, the district shall not un unlawfully discriminate on the basis of sex, including gender identity, gender expression, and nonconformity to gender role stereotypes, sexual orientation, race, color, national origin, including English proficiency, surname, or language minority status, ancestry, religion, creed, age, pregnancy, marital or parental status, homelessness status, any physical, mental, emotional, or learning disability, or any other legally protected status or classification in its curricular, career and technical education, co-curricular, student services, recreational or other programs or activities, or an admission or access to programs or activities offered by the district. This includes, but is not limited to, admission to any school, class, program or activity, standards and rules of behavior, including student harassment, disciplinary actions, including suspensions and expulsions, acceptance and administration of gifts, bequests, scholarships and other aids, benefits and services to students from private agencies, organizations or persons, instructional library meeting materials, selection and reconsideration methods, practices and materials used for testing, evaluating and counseling students, facilitator facilities and opportunity for participation in athletic programs or activities and school-sponsored food service programs. So you can see uh, the pupil non-discrimination law actually applies to all aspects of the school district as it does in all school districts in the state of Wisconsin. And so we use the state policy as a guide uh, to the data we collected and to the report that we put together. So first we'll just start out with the quantitative data. So one, uh, our, our, our evaluation had two parts. So one was what we call an equity audit, which was the more quantitative data. And then we also conducted focus groups, which we'll talk about, we'll talk about those themes and they're gonna be ending with the recommendations um, from the report. So this is not all the data in the report. We just selected some of the key data. So importantly, again, like we look at um, all students all students in the district. So, you know, by race, but by class, by disability, et cetera, in alignment with that pupil non-discrimination policy that we just reviewed. So for this slide, if you look at students with disabilities, we can see that 13.9% of the students in the district are labeled students with disabilities. Um, but um, for students receiving in-school suspension, 100% of the students receiving in-school suspensions are students with disabilities. 32% of students receiving out of school suspensions are students with disabilities and 40% of students receiving expulsions are students with disabilities. And so it's important that this data and with some of the data that we'll be looking at is that um, uh, what we call proportional representation. So 13.9% of the students in the district have disabilities that we would expect across these uh, uh, expansions and expulsions it should not be more than 13.9% because when it is, we know that the students with disabilities are over-identified or over-represented in these areas. So that's just one example. So for students receiving free reduced price lunch in the district, of which 16.5% of the students receive a free reduced price lunch, but 27.2% of students labeled for special education receive free reduced price lunch, 10.2% of students labeled gifted receive free free reduced price lunch, and 7.7% of courses at the advanced courses of middle and high school level are students who receive free reduced price lunch. And again, you can see the line going across about what representation uh, should be across all those areas. When we turn to achievement, um, and this will point out uh, some of the, what Elias is talking about is that this, this work is not about one group of kids over another group of kids. This is about all kids in the district. And the district is already 
uh, you know, rigorous and has high expectations for all. This is about moving the district forward um, for all students. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner when you look at math achievement. So in the, in the brown bar, students are receiving free reduced price lunch in the orange bar. So we can see that 61.6% of, uh, of students in the district who receive free reduced price lunch are basic or at the basic or below basic level in math. If you look to the right, then we can see that 38.5% of students receiving free reduced price lunch are advanced or proficient. So you can see the flip side. So students uh, who are at middle to upper class, so that means students who are not receiving free reduced price lunch um, are 34.6% are basic or below basic in math. And whereas we see that 64.4% of students who are middle to upper class are, are advanced or proficient in math. So what's important about that, so you see that there's a, a, a gap, there's definitely a difference between kids who are experiencing poverty or free reduced, free reduced price lunch versus kids who are middle to affluent. But I think what's important about that data, and you're gonna see it throughout, even so, what we see is that actually more than one third of students in the district who are middle to upper class are basic or below basic in math. So there's a gap, but what we know is that, and the district is doing well in so many areas, but what we see by that data is actually math can be improved across all kids in the district. So even kids who are middle to upper class kids, could, their math scores can and should uh, you know, be raised and continue to do better. So this is the work that we're talking about. The you know, rising tide raises all ships. So this is about, again, literally all kids in the district. So if you look at the reading achievement data, we'll see similarities. So on the students receiving free reduced price lunch are in the orange. So 63.8% of students receiving free reduced price lunch are actually basic or below basic in reading. Um, and only 36.2% are advanced or proficient in reading. And then students who are middle to upper class, 37.1% are basic below compared to 61.8% who are advanced or proficient. And again, I think when you think about basic or below, what that means is these kids are not on track to, for post-secondary options is one, and we know that that's important in the district. So that's an example. We take a look at discipline data. Um, we look at, um, on the left side, total percent of students who identify as students of color in the district is 11%. But in school suspensions received by students of color is 3.7%, but out of school suspensions received by students of color is 19.4%. So we can see that out of school suspensions for students of color are way overrepresented by students of color. When you disaggregate that data by um, race, we can see that 1.3% of the students in the district identify as black, but then they represent 4.9% of suspensions. 3.8% of students are multiracial, but they represent 9% of suspensions. 3.8% of students in the district are identified as Latinx, but represent 4.9% of um, discipline suspensions. When we turn to reading achievement, when we look at race, so we see that on the left side, 41% of white students are basic or below, but 58.2% are advanced or proficient in reading. We see black students, 76.3% of black students are basic or below in reading and 23.7% are advanced or proficient you can see to the right, multiracial, 54.4% basic or below, 45.6% uh, are advanced or proficient, 51.7% of Hispanic students are basic or below in reading, and 41.2% of students are advanced or proficient. When we take a look at students who are labeled ELL in the district, so these are the English language learners. Um, when you see these, again, when we look at reading, students who are in the orange, students who are eligible for ELL services nearly 80% are basic or below in, in reading achievement in the district. Um, and then if you look on the right side, only 21% are advanced or proficient in reading. When you look at students who are not eligible, so students who, whose home, angling, home, uh, home language is English, we can see that 41.7% are basic or below, whereas 57.1% are advanced or proficient. We see similar numbers with math. So students who are eligible for ELL, oh, English language services in the orange, 60.5% 60, 60 are basic or below in math, 39.5% are advanced or proficient, and we see pretty much the flip. So students who have English as their home language, 38.6% are basic or below, and 60.3% are advanced. Again, you see a gap, but you also can see the um, additional work that's gonna be needed in reading and math across all students in the district. We take a look at advanced placement courses in the district. So this is again at the high school. 
you know, we have 10.8% of students with disabilities in the district and we see less than 1% are in, are advanced uh, disabilities or advanced placement courses. Keeping in mind that only 1% of students with disabilities in the district and in the state and nationally actually have an intellectual disability. So by definition, all the other students in the district labeled with a disability are actually at average or above average intelligence. So we can expect students label with a disability who don't have an intellectual disability actually to be achieving along with other students. We look at students of color in the district at 11% and then, but only represent 6.6% .6 of students in AP courses. 16.5% of the students in the district receiving free reduced price lunch, but they represent only 7% of students in, in advanced courses. We have students eligible for, again, for ELL services, English language services are about 2%. And actually we, um, the district reported no students um, who are receiving English language services are in any advanced courses at the high school. So that's just a snapshot. So again, we report is 70 pages. So we just wanna share just a snapshot of the data to show some of the differences um, when we look at uh, between math and reading and some of the other data areas, but also then looking at the trend across all students in the district. The second piece of data that we, were, we um, pulled together were focus groups. And some of you um, uh, think even in attendance are part of our focus groups. So again, we appreciate all the time the district did in pulling our data together and also all the community members who participated and staff who participated in our focus groups. So we did 64 focus groups plus 10 individual interviews and across all those we interviewed about 270 people. This included general education teachers, student services educators, um, principals, students, community members, administrators and board members were all part of those focus groups. In the report, we go through and we detail, um, you know, we, we show, we share information from our focus group and these are the themes that emerged out. We are not gonna go into those in detail. If the um, board has questions on those at the end, feel free to ask, but um, I'm just gonna read down through. So we had identity development training, desire for opportunity for, for civil discussion, curriculum and instruction, student treatment related to the Wisconsin Pupil Non-Discrimination Law, student representation and courses, understanding of evidence-based practices, district use of data, planning time, high expectations and rigor in students who struggle, other professional learning, discipline and behavior and district policies. Again, those are themes and we had information from the focus groups um, uh, from which these themes emerged. So I'm gonna turn it over to Elise, who's gonna now just talk about some of the essential next steps that came out of our the equity audit, the quantitative data and the focus groups. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And then um, after I finish, so we'll go through um, the essential next steps or recommendations of the report. And then once I complete them, we'll certainly open for questions. So the essential next steps based on what Colleen talked about. So based on the quantitative data and the qualitative data that came from the focus groups, we really looked at, so, so what are the next steps for high quality teaching and learning for all students? to interrupt some of those gaps and access gaps, to interrupt um, some of the things that um, folks said as far as it fell into the themes that Colleen talked about, uh, really looking at what high quality teaching and learning looks like for all students. So it started out with just really knowing the history of educational marginalization. Like what, historically, how have schools been set up for over 200 years? I mean, one thing we know about the history is kids with disabilities actually did not receive instruction in the core of teaching and learning, right? So we also know that we had different schools for different kids for a long time across race, across gender, across socioeconomic. Um, and so it's really important just to know that history. We also have a phenomenon with the history that we tend to see the child as needing to be fixed versus what can we do within the system. So we talk about the history of education, just to put it in context relative to what we're doing today. We also look at the shift from deficit to asset-based language and thinking. This came from the focus groups of a real conversation of uh, how do we actually see whether students are experiencing poverty or students have a disability or by race, does our understanding of identities different than ours actually interfere with our perceptions of a child. Engaging in identity development, 
Um, again, this really looks at how do we grow in understanding people that are different than us. Applying the equity research of really what does the research say about high quality teacher and learning of all students. And then we have developing equity non-negotiables and I'll talk a little bit about that. School districts often call them principles of excellence as well. Again, what Colleen went over was the equity audit and some um, just very specific data from that equity audit. And we'll talk about just follow-up recommendations around that. We'll also talk about just a little bit about the realigning staff and students and then constructing ways for teachers to collaborate more, which came up in focus groups. Identity relevant teaching and learning, again, discipline and behavior, really looking at the quantitative data as well as the qualitative data. Uh, students with significant disabilities, aligning human resource systems, leveraging funding and cross-checking policies and procedures. So all the essential next steps fall under those areas. Uh, so again, the first one, know the history of educational marginalization, which is just the history of education and who received education and who did not. And so really understanding a, a professional development around this um, so that we can lift all kids up. Um, and then we talk about in order to do this, we often ask school districts and schools, teams within schools and all educators to really kind of draw out their current way and their current structure of delivering services for students. Where are kids located? So we often define this as where kids sit, where they're located defines what they learn. And you can see from some of the quantitative data that Colleen talked about, just the percentage of kids that was disproportional to the percentage of kids in the high school across socioeconomic ELL, special education by race in AP classes. So really being able to take a deep dive into that area the other part is shift from deficit to asset-based thinking. How we talk about children and families matter, right? It matters. And so staff talked about it, community members talked about it, really having opportunity to really think about our language and how we refer. And so we often talk about it as person-first language or bias-free language. And then participate in activities that um, help understanding across um, different stereotypes and misassumptions, assumptions where a child is experiencing poverty or a child who's linguistically diverse. Um, sometimes we often see um, children and families who are linguistically diverse as needing support when we also know that being multilingual is an asset, right? And so how do we support students in that way? Again, engaging in identity development of really being consistent in professional development. Um, staff reported that they did um, much of their own professional development, but we're hoping for an organized, consistent way of really understanding identities of others that were different than theirs. Um, and then looking at opportunities to increase those um, understandings. And so, but by having choice. So many staff talked about the importance of being able to work with other staff and have choice of areas that they wanted to increase their understanding, anywhere from poverty to disability or cross race to giftedness, et cetera. And then the, uh, the equity audit, understanding that research. Um, so it was absolutely wonderful, the, um, the data and the amount of work the district did in getting us um, that data for the equity audit. It's very comprehensive and it's very detailed um, and what's important about it is what you have right now is, you know, baseline data, right? You have data that says, here's where we are right now at this point in time. And then if the district is interested in continuing to collect e equity audit data, sorry, I actually skipped, but I'll go to here, equity audit data. If the district is interested um, in continuing to do equity audit data as a next step, that will be very beneficial because you can compare the equity audit data over the next year, over the next five years or 10 years relative to the data that was collected for this report. And that will help communicate what changes have happened, how kids are faring. Can we close some of those access gaps when we look at reading achievement and math achievement? And then I'll go back, um, sorry about this, I skipped my order. And then really looking at the research. So many um, teachers talked about really what the research was on best practice. Again, we see equity as high quality teaching and learning. So looking at what is the research on best practice around high quality teaching and learning? Are we doing everything that we possibly can? 
Are we using strategies and practices that have the greatest impact on student achievement? All students, all students. And wanting continued support and understanding in those areas. And then I'm really looking at exactly what are those six or seven ways, whether you call them equity non-negotiables or principles of excellence, but six or seven statements that operationalize high quality teaching and learning. They, districts often use these principles of excellence to, it's the how behind their mission and vision of the district, right? They often use principles of excellence to organize their strategic plan, but they are, they're not belief statements, they're operationalizing. So you can see them in action and what it looks like. Um, and then again, as I talked about the equity audit. And then we did spend some time of really looking at the realignment of staff and students because many staff talked about um, their willingness and, and desire to collaborate, to build that collective capacity. We know that when teachers have the opportunity to share their expertise, it has the greatest impact on student achievement, all students. And so it's really important to look at how are they, how are they situated in a way that they can actually co-create lessons and collaborate around teaching all kids. So we put some very detailed, uh, about four um, different statements around realigning staff and students and really thinking about what we call, we create, we call them um, co-plan to co-serve to co-learn teams, but being able to create those at all levels in order to support all students um, proportionally represented in the core of teaching and learning. Because we know some of your quantitative data is showing access gaps. When kids are not able to have access to the core of teaching and learning, they learn less. When they learn less year after year after year, we see those achievement gaps across kids, kids of poverty, across race, across stability, so across linguistically diverse. So it's really important to look at the structures within the system in order to proactively meet the needs of all learners. And so we talked also about um, some recommendation of, of really looking at the center-based programs within the schools where kids are clustered together by like disabilities and the importance of proportional representation and that students with disabilities can attend the schools they would attend if not disabled, which is part of our federal and state regs. Um, and then also this goes with um, some kids that are with disabilities that are tuitioned out of the district. And then really looking at some of the demographics of the students who attend the school within the school. And is it proportion represented? So we looked at this and um, wanted to make uh, the next step of really gaining more data around this area um, and, and who is actually served within the school, within the school in more detail, understanding that. And then within those co-plan to co-serve to co-learning teams, which are really collab uh, um, collaborative and, and this, um, collective way of teachers to come together to share expertise across general ed teachers, across teachers in the area of special education, ELL, advanced learning, um, to build each other's capacity. So understanding the role and function of individual teachers within those teams in order to collaborate to build the capacity of each other to therefore have a greater impact on students. So we know that you know together we're stronger. We can't all have all the expertise to teach all kids. Kids are different, right? We know they're different. And so it's really important that the staff can actually be aligned structurally so that they can actually share their information and, and um, share their expertise. And the example I wanna give on that, so if the ELL teacher is down the hallway in a resource room and the general ed teacher is in the classroom and a student who's linguistically diverse is going down the hallway for support, that student who's linguistically diverse has to bring that information back to the core of teaching and learning, even though we know the fluency in the English language is limited, right? And those teachers often, just the way they're structured, aren't able to meet. They share information in the hallway, they do the best that they can do, but the structure isn't set up in a way to help them in order to collaborate more. And that's historical. That's why we wanna talk about the history of education as well. That's been happening for a long time because the way we set up schools was to set them up by separate disciplines. And then when we do that, teachers across disciplines are not as able to collaborate as they should. 
We then go into identity relevant teaching and learning and the importance of professional development to support all those instructional practices and strategies that have the greatest impact on student achievement. We use John Hattie's work. He's done a significant job of doing uh, meta-analysis, which is really taking the data across thousands of studies and what has the greatest impact. Um, some teachers have delved into that greatly and others have not, um, but there was an interest within the focus groups. And then really looking at the curriculum relative to the non-discrimination law that Colleen talked about. So really evaluating current curriculum relative across identities based on the non-discrimination law. And you could see that went across all identities as well as all areas within the school. And then looking at discipline, you saw some of the data for that, but really professional development specific to how to develop proactive student behavior plans that are equitable and identity relevant. Um, what does it look like? What does communicative intent around behavior? And we know the district has worked very hard on this and has done a tremendous job, um, but being able to be consistent um, across all schools and all students would be important. And then around significant disabilities, complete professional development support across categorical caseloads. This is specific to special education so that um, teachers are both mixed around um, Cross, some teachers are cross-categorical, others are categorical in the district. And um, we know that students have greater, students with disabilities have greater access to the core of teaching and learning when our special ed teachers can be cross-categorical within the district. And then um, going a little bit more into the district office, just as far as aligning the resource system, um, just thinking about high quality teacher and learning for all becomes responsibility of all leadership. And it would be necessary to take a really systematic approach where all staff are responsible for learning to advance learning for all versus hiring a district equity coordinator. So we're not supporting the hiring of a district equity coordinator. We know that that might um, feel in opposition of an equity report, but based on our 30 over 30 years of experience that we know that when all individuals in the district, all administrators, all educators own high quality teaching and learning for all students and take a really strong look at the essential next steps delineated in this report, that that shares the ownership and actually has a greater impact of all kids learning more. Um, so we also looked at just really creating position descriptions and interview questions that align to the district's principles of excellence. And those are example principles of excellence are delineated in the report. And then creating those strategic partnerships with local universities to increase the high number or to increase uh, the number of high quality diverse educational staff. And that came up multiple times within our focus groups. And then funding should be aligned to the district principles of excellence. Again, we're saying really conduct an equity audit and student demographics across extracurricular as well. So the equity audit we did did not include as much of the extracurricular and we would recommend that it would. Um, the equity audit that we use is what we developed that you can actually add questions to it, but we'd suggest to continue looking across um, um, extracurricular activities as well. And then based on data results, the district and schools will increase options and access. Um, and some of the things came up with who has access to these extracurricular opportunities. And if you did not have a way home or able to stay after, and you had to catch a bus, you actually weren't um, able to, or you weren't able to be involved in um, specific um, options after school. And so it might be important to look at, really think about um, the opportunity of a late bus so more kids can access after school activities. Again, across checking policy and procedures, this is really important around the principles of excellence. The, again, we see those as operationalizing high quality teacher and learning for all kids. And so looking over, obviously the board looks at the policies and procedures all the time, doing a cross check so that they align with the principles of excellence once developed would be important. And then the school board can receive additional training on what does high quality teaching and learning look like. And so those are our recommendations um, across all our areas. Um, and so we really want to thank you for this opportunity and then open it up for questions. Okay, is there questions from board members? Okay. Yeah, Bruce. 
Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for the comprehensive report, all the data that you pulled forward here and uh, the information that's been provided. So thank you for that. Um, can you maybe just remind me or talk a little bit about the, the data set and the time uh, in which the baseline or benchmark data is based upon? Is it a one year look back? Is it a five year look back, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, for the so the um, focus groups were obviously current. The equity audit data, which I think maybe that's what you're asking about, um, the district pulled together the most recent data they had. So um, I think the achievement was 2018-19 uh, uh, state assessment scores, um, but they used the most recent. It was a data point in time, the most recent data point in time. So that's why we say the equity audit like this is like your point in time data. Um, and then that you should conduct it annually. So this can be your baseline that you can be measuring your progress going forward. Thank you. Other, other questions? Mr. President. Yeah. Yeah. Can you... Um, going back to one of the earliest slides that you shared in the quantitative section, um, the slide about students with disabilities and um, in school, out of school suspensions. I think the reaction of a lot of folks, myself included, um, is, well, is it really reasonable to think that it would be um, the same representation? Wouldn't you think that um, like, you know, EBD students would be more likely to engage in behaviors that would trigger in school or out of school suspensions? So I guess the question is, is in this case 13.9, really the expectation or is it that well you wouldn't expect it to be a hundred percent and there are some things that we could do to decrease that hundred percent that's my question thank you colleen's on mute yeah did you hear that elise I actually um, couldn't hear all of it, so it said my internet was unstable, but I can, um, I, the beginning of it, I, and I can respond a little bit to this and then clean if you want to pick up. Um, so, you know, so I think we've done, I don't know, well over 70 evaluations, and this is the first time I saw 100%. Um, I have to say that. And so it, it, it was striking, right? 13.9 um, would be the goal right? It would be the goal. Um, because we know that the more students are engaged in work, the better that they do around behavior too. So we really want to tie that all in and really look at kind of a proactive system. So we do want to see it go down. Is it going to go down to 13.9 immediately? No, probably not. But can it go down significantly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why we set up the essential next steps the way we did of really looking at, and we took a strong focus of, of disability as well, right? Really looking at how special ed is set up and in inconsistencies across the district. Uh, yes, we have other board members. Um, Molly, you had your hand up higher than Kate, so I'll let call on you first. Thank you. Um, I just had a question about, um, I know, Sometimes when I'm reading stuff, you know, done by a professional and it's not my profession, I kind of read through it and I think, what the heck does that mean? Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit more about what does it mean to have def deficit-based language versus asset-based language? Like, what does that look like one versus the other in terms of education? Thanks. So I can, um, I'm happy to answer that and Colleen, if you wanna jump in. Um, first of all, one part of it that we often talk about is um, deficit-based lang language may not be person-first language. So person-first language is a student with a disability, a student with autism, a student who is linguistically diverse, not the ELL student, right? Not the tier two student, not the disabled child, right? But really using person-first language is asset-based language. And it shifts us, it keeps us focused on the child before their need. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna shift our language and we shift our language, we actually shift how we think a little bit, right? Um, the other part is language, just deficit-based language, uh, 
you know where those kids are from, or you know where that family is from, or they live in that neighborhood. That's often deficit-based language that elicits a response that is not asset-based. It's not looking at the funds of knowledge or the assets that are coming from a range of families, but actually um, it, it's very deficit or, or negative. So asset-based language, and, and we all have, I mean, we all have deficit-based language. And so asset-based language actually helps us um, really shift our thinking process too of looking at the assets kids and families have versus the deficits that they have. Kate? I actually have a few questions, if you don't mind. My first question is, uh, on page 38 in the notes, some of the staff noted that they we're hoping to have some integrative diversity in the curriculum. And I wondered if you could provide an example of what that might look like. So since I'm sharing my screen, I actually can't turn to the report, Colleen. Are you able to um, turn to the report? Yeah, I have it in front of me. So is the question, so I'm looking at page 38. Um, so basically it's identity relevant teaching and learning. So staff wanted to know, have more ideas about how to be able to um, develop and design curriculum with their colleagues that was more attuned with the, like Elisa, the funds of knowledge and the strengths and the assets of the students and families with whom they're working. So is there an example of what that might look like that you can think of? Sure, that can happen in a range of different ways. So um, just thinking of examples that we often offer. So we might give, and, and how students are engaged. So if we give options of um, an activity that's really looking at, in geometry, that's looking at a basketball court, right? and saying, what are the angles when you throw a basketball? What are the angles, right? But not everyone is interested in basketball, right? They're just not. Uh, and so really making sure that we're thinking about the range of learners that we have in our room and what actually helps them increase their engagement will also be connecting to who they are. So what their interests are, what their culture is, um, how they see themselves. So being able to lift them up at the same time and acknowledge um, those identities at the same time, increase their engagement in learning. And so it can be cultural. Um, it can be a conversation of kids who grow up in a city and know very little about farming, right? But, but giving only farming examples, right? It can be the opposite of that. So really thinking about where kids are from, um, what they know, and then how we use examples and increase engagement around identity relevant teaching and learning. Okay, and then another question I had is in regards to information about the uh, AP classes. It's kind of a two-part question or observation and also the English, English as a second language. Um, for the AP program, it's my understanding that kids can join the AP classes regardless of their grades. So any child can choose to be in an, in an in an AP class, am I correct, Nick? Um, there, there are some prerequisites to certain AP classes. Um, you know, so there'll be times when teachers will say to a student, like for example, uh, if you were at the class that's right before you take that AP class and you haven't been overly successful in that class, that hey, this may not be the best option for you mm -hmm. um, because it may be a challenge. But there's also times when you know. Uh, there aren't any prerequisites to certain AP courses uh, and that, that any, any kid that would like to take them can take them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just noted that I have two girls in, that have gone through the high school or in the high school and I've noted that there's not any prerequisites to the AP classes that they're in. So that's why I wondered why there was an underrepresentation, particularly when they can, anybody can join it. And then my next kind of comment or question is about the English as a second language. It kind of mix a little bit what Heather was saying, but I would think that it would be somewhat normal if you were, if English was your second language to be a little bit in a lower category than in math and reading, similar to if I moved to a different country and was trying to learn with their language, I, it would be difficult. Do you find that that's 
common that you're seeing those lower scores? It is common, it's not always common in math. Uh, and so the scores were pretty reflective across reading and math, but it's also the part of how kids are taught. So the example I gave of the ELL teacher down the hallway versus being able to meet with the general ed teacher, which is why we're recommending C3 teams or the collaborative opportunity for teachers is that when the ELL teacher can co-develop lessons with the general ed teacher, they can actually embed some of those strategies and practices that that ELL teacher is using with children 30 minutes a week, you know, 30 minutes, three times a week or twice a week, they can actually implement that five times a week, right? Seven hours a day when they can collaborate. And so it can increase the gain in learning English, right? Um, so we're really looking at structures and practices within the system that can increase learning by teachers collaborating more often. Um, so it's not uncommon to see reading scores lower, but it's also common to see in a really proactive system where teachers have a chance to share expertise so that those strategies that are so effective that are being offered three times a week, and, and it's not the ELL teacher's fault, right? They can't actually do any more than they can do without having collaborative structures put into place, right? Um, but when that ELL teacher can meet with the general ed teacher and the special ed teacher and the reading specialist and other general ed teachers, they can co-create instruction where that information is embedded in the lesson plans and that child gets the opportunity for repetitive trials, which increases the amount of learning and it, it expedites learning over time. Um, and the other question was, I think around AP classes. Right. and access, right. And so what we do know is the more children are removed from the core of teaching and learning at the elementary and middle school, the further behind they are. So they actually don't take those prerequisite classes. So they actually don't have access. So you may not have an entrance criteria into the AP class. And so it's open for all kids, but this is why we, we looked at structures and practices, what do, um, what are the, the strategies and, and um, practices that teachers use that have the greatest impact on student achievement, right? How are teachers collaborating so they can share their expertise so that students don't have to be removed from the core of teaching and learning to get a specialist um, to attend to their learning needs that they can actually, the teachers across disciplines can co-construct or co-create lesson plans that embed that information within the lesson plan so all kids learn more. The more access kids have at the elementary level, the more access they have at the middle school level, the more access they're gonna to have to AP classes. And if they see themselves as capable learners, they're gonna enroll in AP classes. So we want, we want to increase the number of sections of AP classes so more kids can attend, right? But it also starts with structures and practices within elementary and middle school as well. And one more. <laughs> this was a big study, so I feel like it, it's worthy of a lot of questions. Um, and maybe this is a little bit personal, but I see that the Hispanic and Latinx are used interchangeably in the study. And I wondered, I have Hispanic children um, and, and an in-law family that's Hispanic. Latinx is kind of a um, term that isn't something that they would use. And so I wondered, where that might come from and what, what the definition of Latinx is. And if in fact that was on some forms that families are identifying as that. Colleen, do you wanna answer that? Go ahead. So, um, so identity is, is up to the individual. So there are families out there that identifies Latinx often from Latin American countries. So different countries. Um, in South America. So, um, and Hispanic often is um, referred to as if someone is from Mexico or has an identity of, that they actually chose to use the identifier as Hispanic. So it's really up to the family. So it makes sense that your in-laws and your family have chosen their identity and their language. And that's actually who should cho choose it. And the reason we interchange it is because it really does depend on the family. 
Mm -hmm. That next just seems like a new term. So I wondered what that definition is. It, it's more, it's in, considered to be more inclusive, but it, it might not be, it doesn't mean that your family would use it, right? They don't have to, but other families may. Any other question? Yes, Molly. I actually, in reading through um, the report, um, the extended report, I was surprised a little bit on how, where things led um, and that it organically kind of went, I guess, towards um, students with disabilities. Um, the one thing I was surprised about not seeing is, was gender ever brought up as an equity issue or even LGBTQ? I mean, it was kind of in the beginning in terms of um, bullying, harassment, teasing, but I don't think gender was ever really discussed. I wonder if you had any information on that. So gender wasn't brought up as much, but there were a couple examples and they were delineated in the report. And we see that falling under identity development. Um, so it, also across LBGTQIA, uh, so it all falls under identity development and increasing awareness. And so that second goal around identity development also was about teachers really wanting to pick their specific areas to learn more in, whether it was around gender or race um, or sexuality or language or religion. So all of those identities came up within um, the focus groups. Any other questions? <clears throat> I guess my observation, I want to echo what Bruce stated. Uh, thank you for your work in this area and for re your report. I think your presentation uh, fairly um, represents, you know, what was in the 78 page report. And I guess I was positively surprised, I guess, as to the outcome from the sense that, um, you know, we don't have uh, major areas, I, obviously there's some ways uh, you recommend that we do things differently. For instance, how we treat special education and tuitioning out those students and so forth with recommendations regarding those disabilities, developing C3 teams and professional uh, development seems to be the top three. I don't see in your report uh, where we need to do major changes to our curriculum review process or that we have to do major curriculum, you know, changes overnight or anything like that, or, or even hire an equity coordinator. Um, did I, is my takeaway from the report um, consistent with what you presented then? Yes, it is. I, I wouldn't, um, so the, just as far as I'm thinking about um, identity development is really important. And so um, what the other board member just brought up is just as far as surprised about special education, we, you know, there are structures within the system that limit access to the core of teaching and learning. And so it's really important that we look at those structures and create a system where all kids have the access to the core of teaching and learning are proportionally represented in that way. At the same time, the more teachers are able to really continue to grow and understand across identities, the better they are able to teach a broader range of kids, which then, yes, it leads into the C3 teams, which then um, leads into really looking at the collaboration and then also the structures within school that keep kids separate, whether it's special ed or ELL or gifted or AP classes that don't represent all learners, right? So we're looking at access, right? access teachers able to teach a broader range of kids, but also the ability to collectively um, collaborate with each other to share expertise. So yes, I think so. And that's, that's what a proactive system looks like in high quality teaching and learning where, where all kids learn more. So that's the intent of this. All right, Any, anyone else have questions? Otherwise, I'm sure we'll be getting back to you and we'll be addressing this at our work session then with administration on how we might be able to incorporate some of these recommendations. Yeah, we'll be uh, kind of putting together kind of a next steps. I mean, there are things in the uh, essential next steps 
that we are currently doing that we are already underway and, and things we've talked about over the last, you know, couple of years. And there are other things that, um, you know, are new for us. And there are things that we may say that we totally agree with and other things that maybe we don't agree with. You know, I had a conversation with Colleen and, and Elise uh, a couple weeks ago when it first came out with the, um, the discrepancy between uh, kids with special needs and reading and math achievement. Because although 1% of kids uh, are identified with cognitive intellectual disabilities, you know, the state average is 14% of kids are diagnosed with some type of learning disability or physical disability or, you know, speech disability and things like that. And so in order for them to be identified as having a disability, they have to be discrepant from their peers. Otherwise they wouldn't qualify for the services. And so we've kind of gone back and forth on that and what that looks like. Uh, not that we can't make gains and, and want to make gains because we absolutely do, but, um, but it does, it does create some challenges. We know that of all the different subgroups, when we're talking about achievement, um, you know, that's, that's one of the main measures obviously that we're using when we're identifying for special education. But, um, you know, we'll continue to kind of work through this, you know, we're going to, as a team, as we've kind of got our, you know, uh, just gotten this report, we'll talk with principals, we'll talk with our, our leadership team as to, you know, what are kind of some of the next steps and what are some of the things that we think are absolutely, you know, where we'd be recommending the board and take a look and, and other things that, um, you know, we think that, hey, maybe those, uh, although they are important, maybe not a direction we want to go at this time and, and things along those lines. So I would imagine over the next uh, few months, that's what the team and I will be putting together and, and working, obviously, you know, getting more clarifications and follow-ups with Elise and Colleen on this, on this process. So. Yes, Heather. So just um, <clears throat> one more question. I mean, it's um, reading, reading everything on paper is um, good. Uh, I'm seeing reference to the studies. Are, are there um, outside of, you know, lab schools, let's say, are there districts that if leaders from this district wanted to get a sense for, so what does that look like when you have a district where you don't have centers, you don't have kids pulled out, districts that are really using this? I mean, is this still kind of a, an academic ideal, or are there in fact districts that we could, um, that, that leaders from the district could visit and see what that looks like when it's, what, when it's fully implemented? Absolutely, and we'd be happy to connect, um, you know, the leaders within the district with other leaders across the state um, that have been doing this for years, some 10 years, some 20 years, some three years, right? So happy to do so. Great, thank you. All right, anything else? Otherwise, I wanna thank you for your presentation and we look forward to working with you um, in those next steps. Wonderful, thank you for your time. We really appreciate the opportunity um, and we completely enjoy meeting um, the community members, staff, administrators, teachers, um, and students um, within Hudson School District. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. All right, now we have, we'll move on to department reports. And I was just wondering, is there a need for us to continue the Zoom? Uh, the, the Zoom will be kept on for the streaming, but there's no reason to keep the, stream, the Zoom on your monitors in front of you, because there's not a report that you, you need to see via, this, via the Zoom. Very good. All right, Next, first up is uh, school age care. I presume that folks will be coming up to the microphone or yep. zooming in. Michelle's heading up right now. All right, very good. How's that? Good. Thank you for this opportunity to speak about school age care. As you can see by the slide provided, our numbers were lower last year due to COVID. However, we are beginning to see those numbers start to increase. The slide is pretty self-explanatory, so I wanna take this time to share a little bit about school age care. Many times people ask me, what is school age care? What do you do? It's just watching the children before school for working parents, right? Here's where I pause and say, let me explain what school age care is. 
Pretend that one day you decide that you want to fly a plane. What is the first thing that you do? You sign up for lessons, learn how to work the controls, sign the forms, get a license, etc. But when does the real joy start? It starts when you begin to practice what you have learned and develop your passion for flying. When you are flying solo for the first time and you feel that sense of accomplishment. That is what school age care is. Many times children come in after school excited to try what the teacher did in class. They want to try it differently and they want to try it all by themselves. Maybe it's that science experiment. They think, okay, it's, it worked with little rocks, but will it do the same thing if the rocks were heavier, lighter? Maybe it's the book the teacher started reading and they want to read ahead because they can't wait to see what happens. Can you get us this book, they exclaim. Today, the gym teacher showed us how to bat differently. Will this work for me? This is the time when children start to develop their passions and practice what they have learned in school. A good school age care program provides all of these opportunities. Hudson happens to have one of these excellent programs. Where does this excellent program come from? It comes from our dedicated staff. The staff that are here at 6 a.m. and again until 6 p.m. The staff that was here during COVID that changed their schedules for late starts, early releases, snow days, two hour COVID release days, then three hour COVID release days, summer hours, non-school day hours, and the list goes on. Can you change locations? Can you do all of this outside? They are beyond flexible. They are the first school district personnel parents encounter and the last ones they see at the end of the day. They re represent our schools in an incredibly professional manner and make our schools shine. These staff provide breakfast, homework help, and stimulating and educational activities. They are the ones who get the children who are ready to play ball at 6 a.m. into the gym and the soft place for the ones who just wanna snuggle before the school day. They provide stability and love. They provide the support that children need in order to be successful during the school day. These are our heroes. We have some staff that have been here over 17 years. They provide consistency despite heavy staff turnover in this field. They sometimes work short staffed and are always willing to stay longer to get the job done. Without their dedication, this program would not be the success it is today. They are responsible for this excellent program and I'm incredibly honored to be a part of their team. In addition, since Tracy is gone tonight, I feel I can share a little bit about her. Tracy is the backbone of our quality program. I've been honored to learn how to become a better leader and a better provider of quality childcare because she is always striving for excellence. Every single decision we make starts out with what is in the best interest of our students. In addition, she is always willing to help out. She makes slime, subs, gets us t-shirts and takes the time to really listen when I'm sure she has a lot of other things to get done. Many times on a Sunday night, she is at home working and sending me numerous emails about what our program needs next. This is my 29th year in school age care, and I have learned more from her in the past four years than I did in the first 25. She is a tireless, tireless advocate and supportive leader regarding what is best for our children. And that is my update on the status of school age care. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions on the report? All right, thank you very much. Next report up is transportation. Good evening. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> All right, my name is Steve Shonick for those of you that I haven't met. I'm the assistant director of transportation and then this year I'll be an associate principal with Shannon Sexy at North Hudson and Holton. So when I sat back and thought about the accomplishments or highlights for transportation this year, the director, Andrea, always gives me the advice, try to tell a story. Well, it brought me back to three years ago when I started in this position, when we just purchased Traversa routing software and had to restructure every single route because we read, redid the boundaries. Sitting there lost as to what the pins on the screen meant, thought to myself, okay, I can do this, let's go. Put together a team 
that came with everybody at the buildings. The success of this department truly came from hundreds of different people. <clears throat> In that three years, we implemented that software. We placed and maintained tablets on our buses that provide our drivers with real-time route changes and leads to increased efficiency daily. We integrated state-of-the-art technology in our student ridership scan platform, allowing us to know where our students are at all times during the day. Finally, we provided our families with a form of communication they never had before with our Ride360 parent app, which currently we have almost 1,500 users. It was truly a combination of these resources, a super positive relationship with Safeway Bus Company and the support of our staff that made this year's success. Last summer, we sat back in our leadership team and said, talked a lot about the school year, but then came down to, well, how are we gonna get them there? What's that gonna look like? They're recommending six feet. We put 60 kids on a bus. What does that look like? With the support of the board, we move forward with, will social distance when possible? We collaborated with Safeway, came up with a plan. They restructured their check-in procedures. They implemented temp checks every day. They have COVID-19 questionnaires. I can proudly say we had zero missed routes due to COVID. Buses were sanitized after every run. The drivers sanitized in between the elementary, high school, middle school routes, and then they were fogged by the fleet manager every morning and night. We provided 10,000 masks, which were available for all students and staffs that were in need, and we collaborated with buildings and grounds to make that happen. We implemented mask procedures, and we followed the same lines of <clears throat> correction that the schools did, and we worked very closely with building administrators to follow up and follow through. We had 68 recorded mask violations with nobody getting kicked off the bus for the school year. We implemented communication of seating charts for every single bus 4K12. I would say that was one of the biggest undertakings. Every kid in this district had an assigned seat on every bus. Close contact identification was used through the use of the bus scan cards. This was probably the most, I would say, prominent, best use of the resource that we had. When a kid scans on a bus, it records that timestamp. If I could see that kid was only on that bus for 10 minutes, we knew we were under the CDC guidelines of 15 minutes. We could go check the seating chart and then we would go check the cameras if needed. We adjusted route times for all PM bus routes in the district twice this year. Once for our two hour early release and a second time for our three hour early release within a week. We strongly believed in that because our staff needed that planning time. We had quick communication through our Ride360 app. Uh, if there was a late bus, we could push out which bus was late. We had snow emergency stops that we could push out through the app as well. How that would work is if you were identified as living on a road that we couldn't get up, we would call you at the beginning of the year, we would email you your details on a stop you needed if it snowed, and we would push it out through the app. We collaborated with the school start time committee to provide insight on the implications of the possible bell time changes and the proposed situations that we had. We created a completely separate world that mimicked our busing and we had to change the bus times for those to meet each scenario. We had the goal to increase our positive transportation experience for our families based on the school perceptions respondent data Last year, we reported 72% of our families who utilized transportation and responded in the survey had a positive experience. This year, we're proud to say that we had 85% of our families say they had a positive experience. The bottom of the report kind of highlights our day, just the day in transportation in the Hudson School District. We run 35 and a half big bus routes four times a day. We met every requirement of being less than two hours and we even shaved off our last drop time this year by four minutes. We run 10 specialized transportation routes four times a day, 16 midday 4K routes, three out of district routes, and numerous shuttles. The accomplishments I presented would not have been possible without the uh, collaboration and collaboration of a lot of people. The number one was the bus drivers. We're talking about an age group that was probably almost at the high risk level at the beginning of the year. They showed up. They showed up for the kids. Tracy Habashalin set up one of the most active posts they've ever had on Facebook was Bus Driver Appreciation Week this year. The parents came in, 
They had all good things to say about the drivers, and they're the reason it got done. I wanted to say thank you guys for all your support, the resources you put into this, believing in that we can get it done, and the great school year. And a special thank you to Andrea, the Director of Transportation, and our new transportation assistant, Kelly Schickling. All right. Any questions? Thank you for your report, Steve. Appreciate it. Mr. President, oh, yes. just one quick comment. Um, you know, I, thank you for your work, Steve. I think it's easy to think of this as just being a challenge of getting kids to and from school, not recognizing what happens on those buses. And I was reminded of that this weekend. I was um, with, a, with a dad and two kids outside of County Market um, selling rotary car raffle tickets, but that's another story. And a guy walked by and the dad said, isn't that bus driver Tim? And the kids' faces lit up and they turned around and said, bus driver, Tim. and here it was their bus driver from like three years earlier. And that instant connection and just joy and reminded me that there's a lot happening on those buses and it's not just about getting kids to and from school. So thanks for all of your work on what is also a pretty important part of, of our students. They appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that comment, Heather. Uh, next up would be Dave, I assume, with teaching and learning. Yes, thank you. And glad to see they were so succinct. Nick told us we had 30 minutes, so I'll just take up what they left on the table, if that's okay. So you're welcome, Bruce. All right, so this past year, we restructured teaching and learning, and um, that restructuring resulted in an increased responsiveness to student need, to administrator need, to teacher need, and specialist need. And um, there was also a cost savings to the district as a result of that restructuring. And tonight, Lisa Scoyne and Ivy Wheeler will be presenting along with me and their positions were both also a result of that restructuring and in their new roles have done amazing work. Also wanted to mention part of that restructuring was to redouble our efforts to collaborate with student services in an effort to really strengthen our concept of learning support services to make sure we are meeting the needs of all students. And when we make decisions, we make them with all kids in mind at the beginning. Um, one of the first things we wanted to highlight was our work with the curriculum improvement process. And we've done a lot with the curriculum improvement process to make sure that it serves as one of our keystone processes. Essentially, anything we do in the world of teaching and learning revolves around the concept of curriculum improvement. Instruction is related to curriculum assessment. It all falls under that umbrella. So when we value something, we build it into that program or that structure to make sure that that process guides everything. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ivy and Lisa, who are going to share some specifics about that and a few other highlights. At the elementary level, we weren't able to meet as district committees during the school year. So the K-5 teaching and learning team met with five committees, ELA, art, music, social studies, and science in June to continue our work with the curriculum improvement process. Another highlight of the curriculum improvement process was the implementation of our new ELA resource, Faunus and Pinnell Classroom. We implemented this new resource in the middle of a pandemic. At the secondary level, we were able to continue the curriculum improvement process as we typically do meeting with teams throughout the year. Our instructional coaches worked with each department to develop a modified schedule to make sure that we could stay on track with our six phases. For secondary science, our team worked with the science departments at the middle school and high school to identify and prepare to implement a new resource. Also this year, we work to increase stakeholder voice. As LSS, we engaged in rounding at all of our schools at least one year and some of our schools twice to increase the amount of feedback that we were receiving from our stakeholders. The Teaching and Learning Advisory Council continued to meet where we engaged in two-way communication with parents through that advisory committee. At the elementary level, this spring, we established department heads. Department heads will provide input and feedback related to teaching and learning initiatives, ensuring teacher voice is heard and considered in our major decisions. 18 department heads were selected. The committee now has representation from classroom teachers, specialists, special ed, ESL, GT, and counselors. We also created and administered a stakeholder survey as part of phase four of our curriculum 
improvement process. The ELA survey was distributed to K-5 teachers this spring. The feedback was analyzed by the ELA committee when they met this summer. A lot of the beginning of our school year was spent with instructional planning for COVID. We held return to learn meetings with school administrators and department heads from each department so that we could ensure thoughtful planning and consideration for unique department needs as we prepared for the school year. We provided professional learning for teachers, including professional learning for using Google Classroom, for IDL instruction, and our coaches continued to provide um, support to teachers throughout the year, which also allowed them to develop new relationships that will um, continue to help us support teachers moving forward. If you look at the first table on the screen, you can see the individual distance learning data. Please note that 61% of our students experienced IDL at some point during the school year. The second table shows the virtual learning requests for the 21-22 school year. Currently, we have 20 students that have requested virtual learning for this fall. Another focus that we've had this year is on our continuum of inclusive supports. We developed a new framework for inclusive decision making, um, strengthening our core instruction and increasing our inclusive practices. We continued professional learning with our rigor teamwork and inclusion team to build teacher leadership. And this summer we implemented APEX, a flexible digital learning platform for intervention, enrichment and credit recovery. Thank you. And I'm just gonna wrap up with some notes on assessment and our virtual charter school. So as you know, assessment is a critical part of what we do. It, it guides our instruction. It helps us know what our next steps are, both from a curricular perspective and from a teaching perspective. Um, but assessment is only as valuable as we have time to respond to the data we collect. So with that, we conducted an RFP for a universal screener. Universal screener is the foundational assessment. It's gonna be provided for all students from kindergarten through 11th grade. We've selected FastBridge as our universal screener, went through quite a process to come up with that determination. The nice thing about FastBridge, it's going to give more actionable data and it actually takes less time to administer than the assessment it's replacing. So it's more time, kids will be receiving instruction, less time they'll be taking assessments. Um, in addition to this, we streamlined our data systems. Um, we're able to provide much more actionable data to administrators and to teachers right at their fingertips so they can spend their time focusing on what they need to be focusing on. And to wrap things up, the Hudson Virtual Charter School, um, Sarah Engstrom White has done an amazing job with our virtual school and our virtual charter school. As a reminder, launching the virtual charter school this year allowed us to accept open enrolled in students to a fully virtual experience. That was the first time we were able to do that. Um, the, the charter process went very well. We just had a few students. We actually have quite a bit more, quite a few more students that are signed up for next year. Looking forward to expand that service. But as you can only imagine, the work within the virtual world was amplified exponentially because of COVID. So Sarah stepped up to the plate, did an amazing job. And I forgot to mention all that assessment stuff that I mentioned. Big shout out to Amanda McCarthy, who's done great work supporting our efforts there. And that is our report. Anybody have a question for Dave, Lisa, or Ivy? All right, thank you very much for your report and your great job. All right, next up, we have a report from our elementary schools. We'll start with Willow River. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I thought I was going ahead of you, so I was already halfway down. Um, I'm Kim Ostrios. I'm principal at Willow River Elementary School. Um, next year, I'll be at uh, Rivercrest. And I just wanted to start by just saying, you know, although this year was, was different and challenging, I was so proud of the staff at Willow River. I mean, when we did our welcome back, they were pinching themselves because they were so excited to be able to have the kids at, at school with them. So that was something... Um, there were challenges, you know, as we're looking at the mitigation, different things that we had to overcome, but we chose to do that through a year-long um, book study. I don't know if you've read the book, The Boy, the Mole, the 
the fox and the, and the horse. And we kind of kept going back to that book throughout the year where we talked about just dipping our toes in and just trying to come together and just celebrate. We had the students with us and we, we didn't have them with us for so many months. But we did recognize that because they weren't with us for uh, quite a few for uh, an extended period of time, we really needed to uh, go back and focus on those students and staff relationships, those connections. So we began the year by, through our PBIS team, which is the Positive uh, Behavioral Intervention and Support Team, in redefining what our school-wide expectations are, and we built in the acronym of, of from our Willow Wows. So we took the word wow and we built out from it with we are kind, our, safe, our school is safe, and we are responsible. And each day during our Raider report, we went back to our Willow Wows, and we did shout outs based from um, shout outs that we got from students and staff. So recognizing different areas where students were safe, different areas where our students were um, kind or responsible. And that was in addition to our base tier one PBIS um, blue tickets and reward system that we already have in place you know, across the district. So through that, those shout outs that we had through our Raider report each day, we recognized at least two or three students or staff alike. And then they came to the office, we got their picture taken, we made a phone, I was able to make a phone call home with each one of those families or staff members, if it was their spouse, they got to pick and just trying to keep the morale um, positive and keep those connections really strong as we are going through throughout the year. Year. So through that, I was able to connect with at least 130 Willow families and uh, 30 plus uh, staff members, spouses. So um, it was just a, a great way just to, to keep it, keep us focused on those, those, that positivity of having our, our students with us each day. Another thing that we really uh, went back to with those student and staff connections is we wanted to make sure that as our students were transitioning back into the school setting, that they were feeling safe and they were feeling supported while they were within our care. And they had at least two adults within the school building that they were comfortable in talking to, in addition to their, their classroom teacher, because they didn't get to end the year with their, with their teacher. So there was a, a disconnect as they were coming in. So through our life skill lessons with our counselor, uh, we are able to identify students who didn't feel like they had those two um, staff members. So we discussed this as an entire staff, going back to that book study, going back to that all means all, bringing a philosophy of, of we're in this together, um, which is overused, but we tried not to use it too much. So uh, through that, we had uh, staff were paired up with students. And we also talked about that staff, that those connections are, are more than just uh, a superficial um, noticing. It's getting to know that child, knowing, so what did you do over the weekend? Oh yeah, I see you got your hair cut, you know, and, and having those, those further conversations. So we talked about that as an entire staff. And by the end of the school year, um, we had 98.6% of our Willow students could name two staff members. So we were really excited about that. Although right, right away your mind goes to, and ours did too, what about that other one, one plus percent? What about them? Um, we did look at that. <laughs> and those are our new students coming in throughout the year. But, uh, or those were the students that ended up as long-term IDL students where we really, though that connection um, is, is a little more challenging. Some Thing that we can overcome, but it is just a little more challenging. So those are just a couple of highlights that I wanted to share from Willow River. Thank you for your time. Any questions for Kim? Mr. President? Yes. Sure. I would thank you for your report, uh, and I'm sure you'll be very missed at Willow, um, but best Thanks, of luck Gary. next next year, and I'm sure that's a, that's a huge transition for you, so thank you for being willing to, to undertake that. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that. Very good. Thank you. All right. Next up is North Hudson Elementary. Good evening. Um, I'm Shannon Sexy, principal at North Hudson this past year, going to Holton and North Hudson next year. I can't help but when I'm sitting back there thinking about my report that I gave last year and where we were and the things that we were thinking about and um, most of them seem to be wrapped around things that we didn't think we would be able to do. So I'm really happy tonight to be here to just give some highlights on the things that we were able to do. 
at North Hudson Elementary. Um, first, of our, our, first of all, our SMART goal, we weren't really sure what to expect with the SMART goal, with all the mitigations in place and what that would look like, but I'm happy to say that not only did we maintain our students at the 61st percentile, but we increased that by 2%. But most importantly, I think um, what I want to highlight is our connections with, with families, that being the most difficult part of being in a pandemic. So how did, how did we do this um, with parents? And you don't really know until you get into it that parents were really missing being in school. You didn't really know that. Like you forget that they can't come in for lunch and that they don't see what the classrooms look like and they're not coming in doing baggy books. So we identify things as we go. So what we did is we had um, opportunities for parents to um, do um, virtual visits. They would come in or they could read books. We had teachers kind of up, up the number of pictures that were sent home or virtual videos in the classroom. So that's how we, that's how we kind of increased that with parents. Teachers were really missing being in the teacher's lounge with each other. They were missing the Friday gatherings where they could have snacks together and, and um, catch up with each other. So um, at North Hudson, our teachers took, a, took turns every month and did a traveling little cart. So they came around and they rang their little bell and, and everybody got a treat as they walked around and they got to say hi to each other once a month. Our, our PTO at North Hudson was really good about keeping families connected, even though it was virtual. And they also, they had a sign up where um, families kind of adopted a month and they would bring in flowers or they would bring in treats or donuts or sponsor coffee so that our PTO was really, um, connected in, in or helping with those connections as well. I think probably one of the most important things that I would like to highlight prior to school starting, um, Chris, Chris Strapp, the, the school counselor, was getting quite a few emails and I was, you know, dealing with phone calls of parents who didn't know what to do. I don't know what if I'm going to send my child to school. I don't know if I should send them. What am I going to do? So she sent out a survey and um, the survey indicated that 41% of our students, they were identified by their parents as being anxious and being anxious to start school and had social emotional concerns. That's a lot of students. That's a lot of students that are gonna to come to us in September, super excited to come because they haven't been for so long, but that's a lot of students who were gonna be anxious. So um, Chris Strapp implemented worry groups and met with, met with groups eight times, 20 minutes a session, and different groups throughout. And her goal was to um, increase the confidence in managing their worries by 30%. In the end of it all, with all of her groups, the results showed that two, there was a 233% increase in, in students' confidence in being able to manage their worries. So I think that's really extraordinary <laughs> considering um, what we were looking at at the beginning of the year. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to highlight, students and staff were looking at ways to get outdoors. How are we gonna get outdoors a little bit more? And we have a, a courtyard at North Hudson that could, needed a little love. And so we had some teachers, we had teachers that wrote grants, we had staff that worked together, we had students that spruced up, if you will, the courtyard and um, ordered um, chairs and outdoor spaces that were, you know, that could be utilized by all, by all students. And we had fifth grade students that, that used their recess time to, to help spruce that up. And so that was a nice way of getting the, getting the courtyard more, more utilized and also by getting the kids outside a little more. Um, if, you, if you scroll down, I just wanted to highlight my pictures just a little bit, because this, this can sometimes tell a story a little bit better. The, the top, the top, picture is the courtyard our outdoor learning space students enjoying that the middle one on top that's something that I can't go without highlighting is the one of the bigger challenges that we had is music class without singing so I want to give a shout out to those teachers too to be able for, for them to be able to bring in journaling and um, history of music and bucket drums in music class our fifth grade camp St. Croix that was something that we weren't sure we were going to be able to do and at North Hudson this was our first time doing Camp St. Croix and the, and the students loved it and enjoyed it and it was a 
it was a good thing that we were able to do that. The bottom just shows some of the field trips that we were able to do. Some we did virtually, a couple of them we were able to do in person. We weren't, be able to, we weren't able to do our big STEAM night, but we did smaller grade level STEAM days. And then our students from home, I just wanted to highlight that we started our year with about 30 students at North Hudson permanently doing IDL and we ended the year with six. So, so yeah, I, I just want to, I, I don't think we could have done this without the support of the board and of, of administration and teachers who had really flexible, open minds and willing to, to do the work. And so thank you. Thank you for your positive report. Is there any questions for Shannon? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it got cut from my report, but was was there not a picture? Were you dressed as a chicken this year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody, I, I just met a new family at Holton today, and they said, you know, the last time I saw you, you were getting slimed as an associate principal at Rock. And I said, I vowed never to do that again, because <laughs> I was still washing my hair for eight days, but I did end up in a chicken costume. Yes, we did. Our, our PTO sponsored a, a fundraiser this year and we're able to donate $30,000 towards our playground for next year at North Hudson. So yeah, more really good work from our PTO. Mr. President. Yes. I'd just like to ask a question. This is no criticism to you or, or your staff, but you mentioned the courtyard needed a little sprucing up. I think I've heard, you know, I lived in North Hudson for how many years? I think we've spruced up that courtyard how many times over the years? It always seems to be needing sprucing up. Well, the trouble so, is, is that it's, 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 like sand, you can't plant anything there and have it stay maintained. It's, it's hard to do that, but um, I think it's just an underutilized space. I think it's with time and you know, teachers, it's a beautiful space, but it's been underutilized. So this year, when teachers are looking at ways to, to learn outside and get the kids outside, it's, it's, it's happening. I Come take a look, Bob. <laughs> I was expecting a reaction of, why don't you stop over and help? <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. All right. Yes. Mr. President, just one comment, um, and I, this is, I think ends up going to more than just your school, but a, a special thanks to the elementary principals who were willing this year to coordinate with parents of graduates and host mm -hmm. visit days um, was such a really neat experience for, as a parent of a graduate for those kids to go back and get the high fives from those, those mm -hmm. K through fifth graders um, and see some other teachers. So again, I know that was just one more thing on the top of a really busy year end, but that was super impactful for the students and their parents. And I, I hope it's a tradition that we'll be able to continue. Right. Heather, that's one of the things that I was thinking about that we might not be able to do because the, the the seniors would always come around inside the school. So the way that we did it and kind of did a march around the school, I think that's, it's almost even better. It's almost like a little parade and it, the, the, the kids loved it so much. The North Hudson um, seniors did it twice, <laughs> walked around the school and got their applause. And I think it really, it showed my students too, what, what's to come. So yeah, special. Thank you for your work. And your report. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank We're going to move on to Hudson Middle School. Actually, I should have said it's either Dolph or Jim, whoever can get down to the microphone first. But Jim's got the head start. So Dolph's pretty fast. I don't know. I think I'd lose to him in his new hip. Um, <laughs> Love the bowling shirt, by the way. Yeah. It's my tiki shirt. Okay. Summertime. All right. Um, I'm Jim DeLoon. I'm the Hudson Middle School principal. Uh, this is my first time in a long time being in front of the entire board and uh, Dr. Olette and his team. Uh, I just want to make sure I take the opportunity to say thank you. Uh, 2021 was tough, but I do believe that uh, your leadership and all the choices you had to make, which were always going to upset a large chunk of our population, um, you know, as a building principal, I felt supported. And so thank you. And I think with, with uh, the district leadership and the Herculean efforts of our staff, it, by any measurement, we had a very successful year at Hudson Middle School. So um, some of our highlights going through our SMART goal, you know, we've been focusing on getting those ELA numbers up for several years, and we don't have our forward exam results back yet, but uh, our internal target of 65% of our students would be proficient on their grade level rater literacy exam. Um, we didn't quite hit 65%, but we did improve by about 6%. Um, and 
We set the goal at 65, knowing that if we had an extended time where kids weren't in school, we might lower it. And we did have a little bit of hybrid in there, but um, I'm, I'm really proud of the work we've done with our literacy at Hudson Middle School. Um, we're also gonna kind of start looking a little bit more at double dipping and, and focusing on literacy and math and, and getting those, those math scores up as well. Um, our management goal was really, we've been looking at some of our, um, is a phrase inequitable um, results. And so when you look at uh, the number of students uh, in, in our discipline Swiss numbers, uh, we, we do have an inequity with our students in who are identified with an educational disability and our students who are not in the number of suspension days they have. And then just overall in our student body, uh, we've decided to, um, to really try to tackle lowering our overall suspension rates. We really want kids in class. Um, I think it was well said today by ICS where if they're not in class, they're not learning along with their grade level peers. They're not making the advancements we want and they just get further and further behind. So uh, our goal was to um, reduce by 10%. We were very successful there. Uh, we, we did reduce by well over 10% on both our overall out of school suspension numbers. And uh, we almost reduced by close to 50% the out of school suspension days for students with an educational disability. And that will continue to be a focus of ours at Hudson Mill School. Uh, when you look at some of the highlights, uh, a couple of things I just want to, I'm not going to read through the entire list, but um, I'm very proud of the work our team has done in implementing for the first time a, a, a strong social emotional learning character ed curriculum throughout our advisory period, seven mindsets. Uh, the work we did providing support for our IDL learners and having a virtual calming space for them. Uh, that was uh, the work of our, our student services and our counselors. Um, through this group support, we added a fourth counselor to middle school, and uh, we were able to up our group's support offerings by, we doubled it. So from five um, support groups in the past on a regular basis, we, we, we had 10 this year. Um, and then the next step for us is we have uh, a team from the state coming in in August to train our entire staff in restorative practices. And really what we're, our, our goal is, we want our students in class. And we want them to be in class feeling like they have access to their curriculum. Um, and so we're, we're gonna bring that team in during one day of our four days of uh, preschool learning and, and really focus in on training every single individual in the building on restorative practices. Um, and then finally, uh, just to highlight, uh, number 10 here, uh, HMS did successfully stage our annual dodgeball tournament this year with COVID protocols. So um, <laughs> the kids would be upset if I did not mention that because that's a, that's a big one for them. So uh, I wouldn't want to redo it, but overall, I think it was a, a very successful year at Hudson Middle School. Any questions for Jim on the middle school? All right. Well, uh, congratulations and thank you for your report. Next up will be Dolph then for the EP Rock report, our last of six elementary school reports. Thanks, Jamie. Again, I'm Dolph Schmidt, principal at EP Rock Elementary. I just wanna thank the board for giving us the opportunity, all of our departments to, to hit on highlights and um, I think that's especially important this, this year. Um, I know in the past, the board has had some collective commitments that you've agreed upon the last few years with the staff that I've worked with, we've done that. Um, and normally we, we start at the beginning of the year and we plan out our collective commitments for the full year. And we just felt like with our leadership team, there's no way we can do that. And, and so we decided just to kind of chunk it the first half of the year and regroup and come back and take a look at, at what we want to commit to the second half of the year. Um, the, the first commitment ended up being um, a commitment all year long. And it really, I know as a board, you probably felt the same way, but there was a, a heaviness to the opening as far as kind of the gravity of, of what we are stepping into and thinking about the safety of our students, staff, community. And I, I definitely felt that way too. And that's why I felt like, and I think our staff felt that that first commitment was so important. The, the, the pieces around, you know, more frequent hand washing, teaching COVID expectations to children, um, cleaning surfaces, and not only cleaning by 
custodians, but cleaning by support staff, cleaning by teachers, um, plexiglass up and down daily in our lunchroom. Um, but it was all worth it, right? We kept, we kept our schools relatively healthy. We kept our community healthy. And it's one of the things that um, as a building principal at the end of the year, I, I'm, I'm the most proud of um, our part in what we did for our community. Um, you've heard a lot of our um, building principals talk about connection after the time away. And we, we definitely focused on that too with, with greetings in the morning, goodbyes at the end of the day and utilizing our morning meeting. But we also had our distance learners that we were trying to connect to over um, our computer screens. And so during the first month of the year, we really focused on that. When we looked at the second half of the year, we, we continued to focus in on how we could connect with, with our students learning at home. Um, and we were excited about the new Faunus and Pinnell curriculum. This year, we tried to go a little softer on that as far as just utilizing all the components and staff did a really nice job with that the first half of the year, when things got a little bit easier the second half, we were able to commit to let's get one good coaching cycle in with Fonis Pinnell on, on your component of choice. And again, with the Fonis and Pinnell curriculum, it really is our whole group instruction. So different than what we focused on the, the last couple of years before that with our small group instruction and guided reading. Um, and so kind of taking a look at our, our school goals connected to that, you know, our achievement goal was to have 60% of our fifth graders when they leave proficient or advanced on the Ford exam. Now we're, we don't have those results in yet, but we did have our map results in the spring and we had 58% of our fifth graders at or above that 61st percentile, which is pretty predictive of that. So as an elementary uh, grouping of schools, our, our long-term goal is 70% proficiency. And this year, we were just, it felt like if we can hold steady around that 60%, that'll be a win. And we're really close with our fifth graders with that 58% on, on the, the map. We also looked at our growth goal this year and said, hey, if we can have just average growth, um, that will be good with all the things that are going on. And so average um, for uh, students meeting their growth targets, according to consultants, consultants with MAP, is 50%. So we had 53% of our first through fifth graders meet their fall to spring goal, which we were happy about, especially because literacy had the biggest impact with our mitigation strategies. So in small group instruction, we had the plexiglass. Um, and with our, our younger children, our primary kids, it's the masking when working on phonics and word work. That's really difficult. And then we also had to take our 15 to 20 minute um, guided reading lessons and condense those down to 10 minutes. So there's a lot of changes in, in reading small group instruction that we did this year, just kind of with, with some of the safety per things that we had in place. So overall, I feel really good about having average growth, knowing in the years to come, we're gonna look at accelerating that. So that's a little bit about academics, but there's other highlights that I would like to hit on. Um, we had our 22nd year of mentoring at EP Rock and it would only have happened um, because of the district staff that stepped up and said, I'm going to continue to mentor when we can't have outside people coming in. So I'd like to thank those dis district staff for that. Um, I also want to thank the EP Rock parent group. They brought in treats every Friday to help with morale, which was very needed. I know that Sue Helmers talked about traditions in June. Uh, there's traditions that we had to tweak, but we got in. Um, we were able to have our fifth grade camp, environmental camp for all kids. It looked different. Two day camps, no overnights, but we made that happen. Um, we also were able to have our Veterans Day um, celebration, not in our gymnasium, but we had students out along the block at EP Rock and had the veterans come to us in a car parade. And, and so there's some things we had to tweak. And then when COVID was sunsetting a little bit this spring, we were able to have some pretty traditional things also. Fourth grade and fifth grade track and field days. Um, we had our fifth grade farewell out uh, at, at um, our field. field, And also um, we had our first annual fifth grade um, versus staff kickball game out on that same football field to wrap it up. Um, but I did want to mention two more things. I did want to thank district admin and the school board for your responsiveness, um, you know, adding on the, the early releases and looking at um, a couple of our all day um, professional development days that staff really needed to kind of get a handle over planning, not only for their distance learners, but also the new mm -hmm. Fonis and Pinnell curriculum. It, it made this year doable. And then I don't know if anyone's talked about our, our health department this year, but our school nurses 
and our health assistants were in the front lines helping us figure out, figuring out close contacts. And normally that happened on a weekend when we got the notification and between multiple buildings. So our school nurses were meeting with one elementary principal in one building and then meeting with another one kind of working through who are our close contacts, who do we need to call uh, to get um, uh, that, that communication. Um, handled. And so I, I just want to make sure that that they got the recognition that they deserve for their hard work this year, keeping, keeping our schools and communities safe. Um, but I think it was the board meeting right before we started the year and, and Dr. Gramble just talked about, hey, this is going to be the hardest year that, that we're going to probably have as educators. And, and I would agree with that, but it also ended up being the most rewarding and meaningful of my 25 years. And I had used at a lot of my staff meetings this quote by Kelly Corrigan, and it's just, when in doubt, make yourself useful doing something hard with good people. And we have a good board, a good administration, hardworking, great support staff and teachers, and just wonderful families and students to work with. And so that's kind of been, can, kind of been my mantra this year um, with, with all the wonderful people I've been able to work with for our kids. Is there any questions? Yes, Bruce. Maybe just a comment. Dolph, thank you. Thanks for uh, all the work and the transition. I'm sure all has been uh, interesting as well for you, but uh, appreciate all your leadership there and, and what you brought to EP. Um, maybe just a general question uh, for getting volunteers back in the school. Has that been part of the discussion for next year? I was at a, a grad party this weekend and, and uh, there was one a volunteer from EP Rock who said, I got to get back there. I miss my kids, <laughs> yeah. you know, and much as the volunteers miss it, I think the kids miss it too. And they miss having some of those mentors come in from outside. Um, and I'm sure that the staff miss having those individuals around as well. So um, not looking for any decisions tonight, but, you know, just making sure that that's on the agenda for yep. the 2021-22 year. Absolutely. All right. Well, Adolf, and congratulations on your 25 years with the district. Right. Thank right. you. Thanks for your report. All right, next up we have uh, human resources. That's me. So as some of you know, I'm big into phrases or sayings to use as a focus. And so in the HR department, um, in the past, we've had things like customer service and data integrity or transparency and cons consistency. This year it was do the next right thing. I can't tell you how many times I've used the phrase during this year, which, by the way, comes from the highly acclaimed movie Frozen 2. I could really get going on all the lessons that someone can take from Frozen 2, but don't worry, I'll focus. So throughout this year, it was not about massive new initiatives. It was about that next right thing. When I didn't know what the long-term answer would be or couldn't even answer some staff questions about the future, I always focused on what the next right thing could be. Whether it was returning to work in the fall, wearing masks, extension of the FFCRA, recruiting substitutes, it was all about chunking up the issues and moving forward one step at a time. So to highlight a few issues, I won't go through the whole summary here. Uh, COVID-19, we continuously engage in problem solving COVID-19 issues by supporting our staff through quarantines, infections, fears, and stressors associated with the disease. When it was announced that we were returning to in-person instruction for the fall, we sent all staff a survey asking about their concerns with the plan. We had over 300 staff reach out with questions and concerns. We called or virtually met with every single one to support the transition back. We created and updated FAQ flow charts for staff. We provided for remote work in certain situations, offered subsidized childcare for staff, as you guys know, and sought to be a continuous resource. Ultimately, we coordinated 575 FFCRA related leaves. Of those, 213 were staff quarantines. Staff quarantines typically resulted in at least 10 days gone. We had some staff with a single quarantine out, depending upon if the person in their home was um, positive, could, could have been out 21 days. So these were significant impacts on our ability to staff our buildings, but I am very proud that other than a few high demand days, for the most part, we were able to staff our buildings um, and um, continue with school. So there were highs too, um, like when we collaborate, collaborated, collaborated with Hudson physicians to attain early, apparently too early, according to public health, <laughs> mm -hmm. vaccinations for our staff, where over 630 employees indicated interest in getting those um, vaccinations. And there were lows, like in November before Thanksgiving, when infections were high and stress levels of our staff were off the charts. But we always focused on doing that next right thing. 
Along those lines, we saw and we heard from staff that they needed support, physical, mental, emotional support. So the second half of the year, we really tried to focus in on how HR can support in those areas. For example, we had a fantastic 30-day wellness challenge in February and March titled Trekking Through the National Parks. Um, over 425 participants, 50,332 miles were logged. We had contestants throughout the challenge, or contests throughout the challenge, and my staff put together thousands of gifts for all of the participants. And we couldn't have done that without the support of the Education Foundation. So I wanna thank them again for that. Similarly, our revamped recognition banquet that was held in person at the high school was an amazing event and one we plan to build upon in the future. Finally, I am so proud of my small little staff of four in HR. There's only four. <laughs> it was a fire drill of a year from start to finish and they'd handled it all with grace and grit. Always doing that next right thing for our amazing staff in this district. That's our summary. Okay, questions for Andrea. Kud special kudos for hitting your three minute mark. <laughs> and, uh, no, but I, and, and I think that, uh, yeah, it was a tough year and, um, you know, a lot of different departments stressed, but yeah, HR is, you know, because our learning is all about our teachers and being able to keep our classroom staffed and, um, uh, was a challenge and uh, you guys did a great job. I would have to say that the school board would have met the challenge and finished the uh, line, but we had, um, you know, we had too many injuries that pulled a hammy halfway through the month. So, yeah. Uh, it looks like we have financial services up and ready to go. Mark, we saved the best for last financial services. Tim? Yeah, so, so Mark's gonna take the first few items. I'll take the second. I think we, we only have a minute and a half, Mark. So that we don't go over what Andrea just did. We don't want to go over that, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Now, I'm, I'm a little disappointed because you know, being last finally on these reports, I, I, I keep telling Tim, I, I want to do one of these one year and just go line by line through the balance sheet with everybody, <laughs> which would be just a great way to end it. But we'll we'll skip that, and I'll be very brief. I promise. Um, you've heard a lot of people talking about their staff. And, and what great support they are. And, and it's no different in our finance office either. We have uh, an incredible uh, group um, in our finance office. They've been there quite a long time. And although there's a lot of seasoned, experienced um, employees in our department. So it really allows, <coughs> excuse me, Tim and myself, um, when some of these things like the pandemic pop up and we have to respond to different things, it really frees us up, which really makes things run a lot smoother. Um, and just a couple of things related to the pandemic in 2021 was kind of a ripple effect of the pandemic in our office. Uh, we saw things like the federal funding, um, like the ESSER funding, working through those, um, collaborating with different offices, um, teaching and learning. I know Lisa stepped out, um, but was, was a great person to work with as we worked through claiming some of those ESSER dollars. Um, we're through one and part of two, and then we'll probably, part of two and part of three will be coming next year. Uh, we worked a lot with the FFCRA leaves, with HR. So there was just a lot of coordination between different departments. Uh, one of the big things in our, our office was GASB 84, which was a new implementation that actually got delayed because of the pandemic. Um, you would have noticed that a little bit if you look at those monthly reports where I would talk about how 72 fund is now moving to 21 fund and things along those lines. So a lot of changes for us internally that, that you know, people don't always see where we, I think, have 150 different accounts now that are tracked in our 21 fund compared to 60 and 72. So it's been quite a bit of a shakeup and a change kind of, you know, amongst everything else that was going on. So those are just a few of the highlights. There's more on that bullet list, but like I said, I'll be brief and let Tim cover a few more, but yeah, I just want to thank you for the time. Thank you. Nice job. So, you know, as, as everybody's talked about, um, this pandemic has, has really caused us uh, in, in a good way to work together. We've had a lot of different teams over the past year to, uh, to really accomplish the things that we need to do to make sure that um, students and parents feel good about attending school during a during a pandemic, and that's that's pretty tough to do. Um, we've we've also looked at some of our processes. So we we met with all the departments, uh, all the principals regarding budgets this year um, in in depth and. Uh, New, looking ahead, looking at a probably a pretty tough year. We wanted to make sure that we were doing everything we could to look at things a little more critically with a little bit different eye. Uh, capital projects, we came up with some less costly alternatives and what were being requested. And I think working together to to accomplish those things 
uh, is going to help us in the long run. Uh, we've got a lot of different things down here. Um, we've we've done a lot of work together with different departments, as Mark has mentioned. And, uh, you know, for example, nutrition services, we've talked about that several times and the participation levels going up and down and how we've, we've addressed that with uh, so a lot of staffing adjustments. And uh, at this point in time, I think our projected deficit is going to be probably somewhere about half of what we were projecting. So we've kind of turned that corner and, and that's definitely good news. Um, we, I'm not going to talk about preparation for return to school last year because everybody's heard it a million times, but uh, it was it was pretty interesting. Uh, health insurance was a good another another highlight this year. We were able to um, push deductibles up, uh, put in a copay when we had we we needed one uh, for emergency room visits, and then looking at our stop loss deductibles, raising those up and and uh, having a modest increase of three percent compared to our 6% medical inflation in the, in the region. Uh, we work with com community service and school age care, um, helping to create a plan there to decrease the deficit. Uh, Cybersecurity has been a big deal this year, of course, everybody's heard it. There's been a real big uptick in that. And then uh, we're looking, we're working, we have a team of us together to uh, look at how to best accomplish uh, the student face-to-face -face, uh, reporting that we need to do this year. We're one of those lucky 173 districts that needs to report some extra information to the state. So, um, and that's that's working out well. We just talked uh, with DPI the, last week and uh, they have kind of given us a thumbs up on what we're doing. We wanted to make sure we're tracking the right way. So just a lot of collaboration, a lot of working together and reaching across uh, all different departments. So it's been been very good. And I want to thank Mark as well and, and my office too, because they, as Mark mentioned, they have been very good. So thank you. Any questions for Tim? Yeah. <laughs> it's all about competition, so that's... All right, thank you for your reports. And uh, it's always good to hear the successes and highlights. And it was a very difficult year, but uh, we made it through. And uh, this leads us to the superintendent's report, um, one that I wish we could see not on the agenda, but uh, it's still lingering out there. And that's COVID-19 operational update. Oh, I thought you were talking about the superintendent's report in general, Jamie. <laughs> so it's, thank you for clarifying at the end there. Uh, Do I start it, the three minute timer? It, go ahead. Uh, this will be very brief. Uh, we have no no new information with the COVID operational report. Um, you know, right now we're staying the course. We had a good showing at summer school. Um, you know, we had thousands of kids in our programs between swim and school age care and summer school. Uh, masks were optional. Uh, we had a total of seven cases, I think, up to this point since we've gone mask optional, uh, four of which actually are tied back to almost one situation with uh, siblings. And so um, things have been going very well. Uh, we uh, uh, will kind of put together kind of an all-inclusive set of recommendations as we move into the 21-22 school year. But um, as of right now, I would anticipate that the 21-22 school year looks about as normal as, as we can as we can be. We don't have any intention of uh, requiring vaccinations. We don't have any intention of, or making that recommendation to the board or making a recommendation to the board that we require masking or, or anything like that at this point. Um, you know, you never say never, uh, but um, as of right now, we would say that we would we would expect that uh, even going back to the, uh, the volunteers and things along those lines that we're going to get, you know, get back to normal uh, as we start this this fall. Um, doesn't mean that we're over this yet. And, you know, we'll still encourage people to get vaccinated if they're able. Um, obviously, if they're not able, that's that's understandable or if they have a. Um, you know, disagreement with doing it, but uh, the more we can get vaccinated, the, the better I think we'll be against uh, the Delta variant. That's the big thing that we're watching right now, just trying to keep an eye on that. Uh, but overall, our numbers are, are very promising. So without uh, anything else, I am meeting with public health. We're meeting kind of regularly, getting their take on things, but uh, we did kind of let them know that we are, our plan as of right now is probably to move more towards business as usual as we race start the year. And I would say that's the same theme with all the other school districts in the county. Questions? Okay, very good. Any questions on COVID operational update? Hearing none, I'll uh, now move to uh, consent agenda items and entertain a motion for approval so pursuant moved. to the language in the uh, expenditures. 
So moved. Mr. President. Yes. I move approval of the consent items and that the Chief Financial and Operations Officer be authorized to pay bills in the amount of $1,494,044.42. Second. Okay, we have a motion, a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, the consent agenda items are approved. Uh, next up on the agenda is the student policy series, second reading. Um, most no, of these are procedures, but yep, no, no real changes. I mean, we've we've made some grammatical changes and things like that. Moved away from the term procedure since we don't use that anymore, and we went to rules. But other than that, there's nothing substantive of the changes. So we would uh, recommend approval of the second reading, which means uh, then means these policies become uh, enforced in the district. Is there a motion? Okay. Kate. Motion to approve. All right. Uh, Bruce, I'll give Kate the second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Next up is the elementary handbook. And I saw that uh, unlike our prior handbooks where we saw, you know, red lines or blue highlights of changed words and so forth, this was, uh, it's kind of cool to see the final full whatever it is, 38, 40 page handbook and you know what a typical elementary school principal sees. But um, is there any intro that this needs, Nick? Uh, I, you know, I don't think so. Um, there's nothing substantive, uh, substantive changes. It's, you know, some policy numbering updates, things like that. But uh, uh, other than that, there's nothing substantive. And so those policies we just approved in the new numbers and so forth, that's already been incorporated then? Yeah, I mean, and, and we'll continue, you know, as you approve policies throughout the course of the year, we go in and update those handbooks because it's, it just, it applies, you know, the board policies are gonna supersede the handbook, so. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Is there a motion to approve? Okay, Kate, motion. I didn't hear you because your mic is turned away. So, all right. Is there a second? Second. All right. We have a motion by Kate, second by Bob. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the elementary handbook as presented in the agenda say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Moving on to academic standards for the 2021 2022 year. Um, I guess this is Dave. Yes, thank you very much. So very quickly, as part of Wisconsin Act 55, um, it's required that the board take action approving the standards for the academic year. It's required that it takes place in the first board meeting um, in July. So that is what we're here to do. And um, just real quickly, if we look at the standard revision schedule, every year we share with you what DPI will be doing in terms of the standard revision. So July this month, they're working on essential elements for ELA. You can see the others that they'll be working on. And then quite a list in January. It's a sizable list, more than they typically would do. They got a little bit behind because of COVID. And so once these standards are reviewed, they go through a process and then they're finally approved by the state. So the action you're taking tonight, if you choose to take such action, is that you're approving those that have already gone through the process and are approved at the state level. Um, and we get, again, do this each year. So the recommendation for the motion is on the next slide. Um, I did link there with the Wisconsin Academic Standards so you can see them all if you want to read through each of the standards. Um, real quickly, the reason that it's important, I feel it's very important to adopt the Wisconsin standards is because all of the assessments that we're required to take are aligned to these standards. If we chose to create a different set of standards, which legally we could do, our work would be completely misaligned, and I think that would be detrimental to our students. And that is that. And that's a report. All right. Any questions of Dave? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mr. President, uh make a motion to maintain Wisconsin academic standards as the academic standards used in the Hudson School District for the 2021-22 school year. Motion by Bruce. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the academic standards are approved. Next up is consideration of ratification of the 21-22 certified staff collective bargaining agreement. Um, this is 
Uh, Andrea, and uh, I know that <laughs> Andrea has been uh, the captain of our negotiating team. Board members have been advised of progress in close session, um, as we have to, uh, pursuant to state law. But now this is the time since the teachers have ratified that now it's onto the school board. Correct. So yeah, as both Jamie and Heather were part of the bargaining team as well, um, it was two bargaining sessions ultimately, and we reached a tentative agreement. It was ratified by the Hudson Education Association, and then the subsequent week was ratified by the WEAC Council. So um, it's fully ratified on their part. Uh, the specifics really are um, just that first collective bargaining agreement, so the language associated with the two-page document. And then the other piece is that it is uh, an agreed upon amount of a 0% base wage increase. Our statutory limit was 1.23. Our next agenda item, we'll talk about where we go from here. But at this point, it's certainly the bargaining team's recommendation that, um, that the board ratify this agreement. Any questions from board members on the recommendation? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Right, Heather uh, has the motion, Bruce is the second. Any further questions of Andrea or the bargaining team? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay, and the ayes have it. Next up on the agenda is then 2122 certified staff supplemental pay. Back to Andrea. Yes, so this is the complexity of the bargaining law is that um, under the bargaining law, um, as you guys know, as we've discussed in closed session, the limit of any board approved percentage or any negotiated increase is 1.23%, which is de defined at the state. Um, our agreement was to settle for 0%, but certainly we would like, it's so important that we keep pace with our uh, comparable districts that we continue to recognize, value our staff, retain our existing staff and be able to recruit future staff. And so um, our recommendation is um, to have a 2% supplemental pay increase, which is essentially a 2% increase to their last year's salary as well as um, t the continued implementation of the teacher salary structure. However, it'll just be called something different now. Now it'll be called supplemental pay. Um, it's not technically a base wage increase because we're statutorily prohibited from going above that 1.23. Instead, it'll be 2% supplemental pay plus the TSS and all of that will be itemized out and detailed um, to every teacher in the district with a corresponding addendum letter laying it out. And we are prohibited because the statute limits us to the CPI as defined um, for each contract period by the WERC, Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission. So the 1.23 is that is the relevant time periods uh, cap. Okay. Any further questions of Andrea or this recommendation? I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Mahat Powers, second by Member Bauman. All those in favor say aye. Aye, aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and it's approved. Uh, next up on the agenda is 2122 tutoring rates. Uh, we went through this at the board work session, the last work session. It's just a change to the uh, staff reimbursement rate from $23 an hour to $25 an hour for the individual student. It puts it in line with our staff hourly rates uh, for work with instruction instructional rates so that's a recommendation and this does not increase the cost to the family it does not impact the cost of the family all right any questions uh, for nick uh, or any of the team i guess um this kind of crosses departments when we talk about reimbursement rates and um but hearing none i'll to entertain a motion to approve so moved motion by carrie Second. Second by Kate. Correct. All right. Did that without looking. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. And um, that gets us through the uh, agenda items, but we're last but not least, we would now entertain a motion to convene in closed session pursuant to the language in the agenda. Mr. President. Carrie. The board will entertain a motion to convene in closed session a pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.85 parent one parent D to consider strategies for crime detection or prevention and B pursuant to Wisconsin statute 19.85 parent one parent C to consider the employee evaluation data of administrative employees. Second. 
All right. Motion by Kerry, second by Bob, and this requires a roll call vote. Bauman? Aye. Garza? Hansen? Aye. Loglin? Aye. Powers? Whitaker? Aye. Johnson? Aye. All right, the ayes have it. We're now in closed session. The board will reconvene. In